explosion going on in our world today with modern technology. We know everything about everything. We know all the answers to any question that could possibly be asked. But the problem is we don't know the answers to the important questions of life. Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? Is there a God? Is there an afterlife? These are the questions we really have to answer. And the only person who can really do that is the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. <clears throat> so tonight, I'm going to talk about five episodes involving Jesus, which I think are really pivotal episodes of his life. And they all took place on a mountain. And so we're going to talk about these pivotal moments of Jesus and then how, what's the message in each of these for us. <clears throat> this whole thing started, I think, with Mary Blanning a few years ago and myself. We were going to give a talk to kids about the life of Christ and being a great teacher of kids, I knew you had to do a little more than give a narrative. You had to have something they could hang on to. So I picked five mountains, and so the kids could follow me with the first mountain, and the second mountain, and the third mountain, and so on. And that's why I began this, and then I developed it into a little adult thought. And so we're going to talk about the five mountains, and we'll start, obviously, with the first mountain, the Mount of Temptation. The, uh, all of the gospel, I'm going to read a couple lines of gospel for each of the uh, mountains, and the, all of the gospel readings, these short readings tonight, will be from St. Matthew. <clears throat> And so we have the first mountain, the Mount of Temptation. The devil took him up to a very high mountain, and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their magnificence. 
And he said to him, All these I will give you if you prostrate yourself and worship me. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So the devil, the mount of temptation, the devil takes Jesus. Jesus comes into the desert to prepare himself for his ministry of bringing the kingdom of God into this world. This ministry of bringing us the knowledge of salvation. So he comes into the world. But the devil, of course, before he starts his work, he must prepare himself. He has to prepare himself, open himself up to God. So he goes into the desert to be tempted by Satan, to be tested by the devil. And so as we all know the story from last Sunday, the devil, you know, tempts him three times. If you're hungry, turn these stones into bread. Jesus refuses. The second one, Jesus, <clears throat> the devil takes him up to the parapet of the temple and says, jump down, order these angels to take care of you and then jump down. And Jesus said, not to tempt the Lord thy God. And then the third time, the devil takes him up to a high mountain and says, look at all those kingdoms. And if you bow down and worship me, I will give you all those kingdoms. And then Jesus tells him, only God should you adore. That mountain, by the way, is called Jebel. J-E-B-E-L. And for many of you who were lucky to many times to accompany me to the Holy Land where I had lived for a few months, you know, one of the things you always do <clears throat> is you get in the bus, go down the Good Samaritan Road from Jerusalem to Jericho, and then you get out of the bus in Jericho and you wander around the Jericho. It's all palm trees. And one of the things you can do in Jericho that some people did is ride a camel. The other thing you can do in Jericho is go to the alleged tree that Zacchaeus climbed when Jesus came by, when he was short of stature. <clears throat> and then you leave Jericho and you head back to Jerusalem on that same road. And then the bus stops and the, the tour guide says, see over there, look to the left, and you'll see Mount Jeb, the mount of which, you know, Jesus was tempted at. You see this high peak over to the west, and then you go back to Jerusalem. So Jesus is tempted. So this is a pivotal moment. And what is the lesson that's being taught from the temptation? We all know the lesson because we heard it last week. We're here at the beginning of Lent. Renunciation of my desires, self-denial, opening my heart for God to come in by giving up things, letting God come in. Giving up, letting God come in. That's what we celebrated last week, and that's what it's all about. Renunci if you're a follower of Christ, you have to renounce many, many things. It is not just Latin penance. It's moral life. I was reading a book by Ronald Rollheiser, a great author. He always asks the question, why did God give us terrible, strong passions and tell us not to disobey his way of living? Why do we have strong passions? Why do we have strong sexual passions? We know that because the race must go on. The human race must continue. So God gives us strong sexual passions. But yet, look how those passions are broken or how they're used in the wrong way. Hook up sex. Sex without marriage, sex without love. That's not the right way to go. That's not the right way to go. Or our desire for, you know, for possessions. Why did God give us a desire for possessions? Because we must navigate ourselves through life 
build a house, and so on. So in other words, what I'm saying is that renunciation is part of our Christian life. We must renou renounce ourselves to be with God. There was another one of my favorite authors who used a phrase that really struck me. And we're talking about, you know, the world that we live in and the possible temptations, the wrong avenues we can go down. He used the term rival Lord. We love the Lord Jesus Christ, but there's a rival Lord. And what is the rival Lord? The world that surrounds us with its entertainment and its values and its movies and everything. That could be a rival Lord to us. If we live in that world and want all those values instead of the values of the real one, Jesus Christ. And so, you know, that's what I think the first temptation is we have to renounce all these various temptations that come from our rival Lord. And, and the, let me just read this from the man who used that term, rival Lord, the man named Marcus Bork. <clears throat> Modern culture functions as a rival lord in our lives. In recent years in modern America, a yawning gap has <clears throat> opened up between the Christian tradition and modern culture. The dominant values of contemporary American life are affluence, power, achievement, appearance, competition, consumption, and individualism. And these values are vastly different from anything recognizably Christian. Marcus Borg, the book A New Vision. So the first, you know, mountain, the amount of temptation, God is telling us to we have to have Renounce, <clears throat> renunciation in our life, to give up things, to walk in the path of Jesus, and not in the path over there of that rival Lord we call, you know, civiliza modern civilization. Let your mercy be on us, O God, as we place our trust in The second mount is the Mount of Beatitudes. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he had sat down, his disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. If you read the Gospel of St. Matthew, you have those famous chapters in the beginning, chapter 4 through 7, generally called the Sermon on the Mount. You know, those sayings, love your enemy, do good to those who hate you, pray for those who persecute you, bless those who curse you, and then you will be sons and daughters of your heavenly Father. Beautiful, you know, language of a beautiful Sermon on the Mount. And so we know that we should read the Bible to hear the Word of God. And let's say a few things about the Word of God now. When Jesus speaks, he speaks either in uh, short phrases, you know, like, uh, blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. Love your neighbor as yourself, and so on. You have what are called aphorisms, short little sentences. <clears throat> but then he teaches in parables, and his main teachings are in parables. And one of the things we have to realize about the teaching of Jesus and about parables is when Jesus gives teachings, all his teachings are action-oriented. They're not about poetry or philosophy or the beauty of nature. He's talking about action. Each one of them says, you've got to do this, you've got to do that, you've got to do this. And why are all his teachings, if we look at a parable someday, they all, when you read them, what's the answer? You've got to do something. They're action-oriented. 
Because Jesus was a teacher of a pathway to God. He wasn't a teacher of truths or universal truth. He was a teacher of a path. He was action oriented. And so these, all the teaching of Jesus is action oriented. And of course, we should follow the teaching, obviously, of Jesus and uh, study the teaching of Jesus, read the teaching of Jesus, and read the Bible, read the Gospels, read Paul. You know, that's a great thing to do in Lent. And that's why I gave you these sheets. Um, you know, some hints for a more spiritual reading. You know, this is a good thing, you know, uh, realize that these words were inspired by the Holy Spirit, that these words have a message for you. The, whole, the Holy Spirit who inspired the words also touches your mind when you start reading those words. You get inspired, not just the scriptures. Sometimes it's helpful to read your knee on your knees because, because listening to God is prayer. Remember when you taught in grammar school? Prayer is to talk and listen to God. Part of prayer is listening to God, not just talking with all your needs before God. Um, and then how you, when you're reading, read with reverence because it is the very word of God himself. Read with true faith in the word of God. Read with confidence in the promises of God. Read with an obedient spirit. That is a willingness to be changed by God's word. After reading, ask yourself, is there any command I must obey? God is saying, is there any sin I must avoid? Is there any good work God is calling me to do? And ask yourself, is there any direction that my life should take? That's a beautiful, you know, reading the Bible. They, people used to, in the olden days, read on their knees because they all thought it was a form of prayer. And you have to listen to all our evangelical brothers and sisters. And, you know, what they do with their children, you know, B-I-B-L-E. What does that mean? Does anyone remember what B-I-B-L means? Basic information before leaving this, leaving, basic information before leaving life. That's why we read the Bible. Basic information or not before leaving life. Yeah. Before leaving Earth. Yeah, I can't I guess I can't spell that well. Or you got the message though. Yeah. Before leaving Earth. Yeah. So we read the Bible, you know, for that reason. We want to, you know, grow in God's love. We open. That's a wonderful thing we can do, and read it you know, as a prayer. And that's you know all I want to say before the next mountain. Let your word be the apostle Lord, as we place our trust in. And the next mountain is Mount Tabor. Um, again, you know, a little commercial for going to Israel. You know, there's so many beautiful things in the Holy Land. And your Mount Tabor is a mountain up north. And uh, you can, you'll go up there by bus with your companions. And then you get into, well, now it's buses. It used to be little Mercedes, Mercedes Benz diesel, diesel uh, automobiles, large automobiles. And you go up and up and up and up and up. It's a really a high mountain, and it's very flat on top. And you arrive at the, you know, the top of the mountain, and the first thing you notice, the spectacular beauty. You see the whole Jezreel Valley. Oh, you see almost like half of Israel looking up. And you look down this way, and you see Armageddon, the, where the final battle of the world will take place, according to the book of Revelation. And so, you know, up on top of the mountain there, people used to think in the time of Jesus 
<clears throat> if you had something very important to pray about, if you, you, know, you go up on top of a mountain. Because up on top of a mountain, you're very close to God. And so Jesus has something very important to pray about. So he takes Peter, James, and John, and they go up the mountain in prayer. And while, you know, while Jesus is there immersed in deep prayer, you know, he is transfigured. His, you know, countenance becomes as white as, you know, like snow. The vestments also, or his garments also are tra trans, you know, into beautiful, bright uh, light almost. And the reason Jesus went up there in the first place is to, you know, to pray because he had a decision. We all should pray when you have a big decision. Prayer is the answer. So Jesus had this decision. His mission of bringing God's word to earth, to this world, and to bring God's kingdom to this world, was very successful. He had been preaching all through Galilee, and people listened to him. Had an amazing following of people who listened to him. Many of them followed after him when he went from town to town. So his mission of bringing the word of God to Galilee, the northern part of Israel, was completed. Now, his next step, <clears throat> the more important step, is to wander down into Judea and to the city that kills the prophets, Jerusalem. If you ever you know, many of the, when I'm saying about the city that kills the prophets, Jerusalem killed the prophets. Many of you read at least half of the Old Testament prophets in our uh, Bible are buried in the valley, right in the Kidron Valley, right outside the old city of Jerusalem. And if you go there and you know, you're there and you see, look across the valley from you know the old city of Jerusalem. You see all these monuments to the prophets who were killed in Jerusalem. So Jesus knows that should he continue on, is this the will of God? He's asking the Father, should I continue on to Jerusalem to carry the message there? This could be very dangerous for me. And that's why we have the transfiguration. God is showing the power that's in Jesus Christ. He is transfigured so that he can be disfigured on the path to Calvary. That's why he was transfigured, to get that strength he needed to make the decision he had to make and carry on. And so Jesus, you know, goes on and carries on into Jerusalem. And so I think, you know, the point of the Mount of Tabor is prayer. The prayer before all the important things of our life, to speak to God. But prayer for most people is not easy. In fact, prayer for most people is very difficult. It's not only boring, could be a waste of time. I, if I prayed well, I would have all kinds of wonderful spiritual experience. If I prayed well, I would love my hour of prayer. If I prayed well, I would never have distractions. Nonsense, baloney, terrible. Prayer is a very difficult occupation, extremely difficult thing. You know, Jesus is going, says, go in your room and close the door, but not turn on the TV, but pray to God alone. And so the answer, you know, is through persistence. No, not, it's not your prayer is not going to be good. It's not going to be full of nice things. It's going to be a persistent labor between you and God. And, not, uh, and then another great saying I like is, pray as you can, not as you cannot. In other words, you know, I carry up here, the bankers over there all have their you know, way of praying. And uh, pray in your own words. Pray honestly before God. Don't worry. You don't, you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to have beautiful prayer. 
God loves ordinary, simple prayer. And I think that's what, you know, the word is to us from this third mountain, that we should pray. And then, let your mercy be on us, O God, as we place our trust in you. And the fourth mountain is the Hill of the Skull, the Hill of Calvary, or Golgotha, the mount of the, the hill that looks like a human skull, called Golgotha in Greek and Calvary, Calvaria in Latin. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him. So, of course, you know, this crucifixion is in the resurrection or the center of our faith. And I read a book, or it's a very long book, but a very good book called Crucifixion, The Theology of Crucifixion by, I forget her name, a wonderful woman minister. And she, uh, you know, starts out the book by saying, you know, we have to realize what crucifixion is in our religion. There is no religion in the world that worships a God who is crucified, a God who is put to death, you know, like an ordinary human being. That's really the center of our religion. So I'm not going to get into the pain or the, you know, of crucifixion. We have that. I'll talk about that on Good Friday few weeks hence. But I'd like to talk about, you know, another point that under the, you know, the whole idea of crucifixion, not just the suffering of Jesus, but a couple, you know, lessons for us. You know, that when Jesus was arrested and crucified, his apostles fled, terrified. And the, his former followers, the ones he talked to, were the ones who yelled, crucify him, crucify him. They, had all, they also abandoned him. And then the soldiers, you know, mocked him. And then the, uh, you know, the people walking by jeered him. One after another, rejection, rejection, rejection. So now Jesus is in his final agony. And who is he thinking about? Where is my heavenly father? My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? God did not, his father did not raise a finger to help him. Did not lift a finger to help him. He died, was buried. But the father was there the whole time, giving him strength in his agony, accompanied him into the process of death. The Father was there with him. And that is, you know, for all of us, I think a beautiful lesson of trust. Even in the darkest things that can happen in our lives, God is with us. We talk about the problem of evil. Why did God let this young mother be killed by that drunk driver? Why did this happen? Why didn't God stop that? Why didn't God do this? Now, one of my classmates, a man named John Dedeck, probably the smartest guy in our class, um, when he was ordained a priest, he was not sent to a, par a parish. He was groomed to be a moral theology teacher, you know, teaching seminarians about the Ten Commandments, what is right, what is wrong, what is conscience, and so on. He was a great guy, a you know, very human guy, but you know, very brilliant, wrote a book. And well, in December of the year 2000, he, uh, I think it was gallbladder, I'm not sure. He had something similar to that. And he went into Columbus Hospital, and he had surgery. They operated on him with his gallbladder. And he was recovering. I went and visited him at least once, talked to him. But he was recovering, and he was glad he was going to get out of there a couple days before Christmas. So, of all things, what happens? 
he's recovering now, and he's got, you know, the IV pole walking down, talking to people, you know, carrying his IV pole, walking along. And this is a true story. What happens? He trips and falls, and the IV pole impales him, the IV pole impales him, and he dies Christmas Eve. Terrible, you know, but we trust in God through the story of Jesus. In a way, I think another image I have for trusting in God is by a, an author, a, sort of an offbeat author from England, but I really like what he says. He talked about the problem of evil in the world, how innocent people, how a, a migrant worker is killed by a dump truck and the bodies that are in all these horrible things. And he, then he says, if you could look at a panorama of all the faces of all those killed in a terrible way in these terrible accidents, all the people who are killed violently in this world, you would find one face that you would recognize, the face of Jesus Christ. And that image to me, I think it's a very good image, to see the face of Jesus Christ among all the faces of those who were tortured and killed, those who had accidents, those who had cancer and so on. It's a beautiful image in the sense that it shows that God is with us. God accompanied us in our illness and on our weakness. God walks with us. We don't have all the answers, but we do have a story. And that story is Jesus Christ, which can help us to you know, get ourselves through all these tragedies of life. Let your mercy be on us, O God, as we place our trust in you. The fifth mountain, the Mount of Olives. The eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had ordered them. And Jesus said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And so, you know, the apostles are sent to evangelize the world, to bring the good news of salvation, the good news of the coming of God's kingdom to the whole world. And we too are disciples. We are followers of Jesus Christ. Disciple means follower. And so we are followers of Jesus Christ, and we too are commissioned with that commissioning we just heard in that gospel reading. We are commissioned to follow Jesus Christ. And there's different ways we do that. We become ministers. We, uh, the word minister, you know, the real word minister means in Latin, of course, to serve. We have ministers of care who bring the Eucharist to sick people. We have ministers of the Eucharist who bring the Eucharist to people attending Mass. We have ministers of the Word. People who come up here every Sunday and do the reading. We have ministers of catechetics, people who teach our kids in school, our teachers in Bernadine School, our teachers, of course, in their own, you know, pub, our own public school classes for religious education. So we have, you know, people, we have lots of people volunteering for ministry. And in this past pande pandemic, we get more of this. We need spritzers. We need people to clean the church. We need people to take temperatures. We need people to sign in people. We need, all, we have, you know, it's just amazing. I was inspired by the response to people who are coming in here helping Carlos every day for every mass when you got to take names, you got to sprinkle, you got to purify, you got to do this, you got to purify after it's all over, you got to purify during the Mass before communion. It's, you know, we have these wonderful people carrying on the mission of Christ. That's their ministry, these very various ecclesiastical ministries. And then we have, you know, personal ministries too. I know of one of my former teachers, 
who had a wonderful ministry, not in this parish, but another parish. She spent every month or every Monday night or after school, every single Monday, with she'd go to a different hospital to she have a hospice. She would adopt a hospice patient and spend time with that person, you know, reading to that person, cooking for the person if necessary, uh, doing errands for that person, praying with that person, you know, talking to that person who was approaching death, you know. And then she'd do this, and you know, the, the, the person died, she would find somebody else. And she'd do that, but that was her Monday, Monday night ministry. And I know some, a lot of you probably have things like that, because so many of you are so wonderful to do so many things around here. So ministry is one of the ways we carry out the, the, the final commandment of Jesus on Mount of Olives. And the other way, I think, is evangelization. And I was mentioning in a homily a couple of weeks ago, in a morning homily, you know, that in, we're talking about the world we live in. We just talked about that arrival Lord to our Lord. And in our world today, you know, it's uh, politically, you know, bad uh, to talk religion. It's you don't talk religion, people. Well, that's not, you know, that's not a smart thing to do. We don't talk. It's you know. Anyway, but people need to hear religion, and people, when you you talk to a person, you say. Uh, Tell that person about how you pray. How you pray. Here's how I pray. You have an audience. You have a very attentive audience. Or you talk to that person, you know, here is what I believe about religion. Here's what I believe about God. Here's about what I believe about Jesus Christ. You have an audience, whether you know it or not. Or if you talk to that person, well, here's my spiritual life. Here's what I like to do. I have a devotion to this and so You have an audience. You have a very, very profound audience listening to you. So we can be, you know, that's, and the people who do that, and I know a number of people who do that all the time, you know, talk about God, talk about religion, talk about what they believe. And that is a beautiful way to carry out the ministry of Jesus Christ, the ministry of evangelization. And that, my friends, is the end of the last mountain. Thank you for your attention. So now we have my favorite hymn about to be played. Bless you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.